thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Michelle. I, I guess it's, it's just time to um, not discuss on the panel, but open discussion for the whole plenary and um, get your ideas on the very question wherein lies the transformational power, the transformational strength of the commons paradigm. And um, also, I mean, you have uh, concluded with three questions. Help us answering them. That could be another approach to engage into a discussion with plenary. It's very important that you speak into a microphone. Those are available here. Show us the microphones, please. Okay, so somebody, Utah, can you help us to? Yeah, this to be the Ah, there are two microphones. One is over there, the other one is over there, and one right at the end of the room. Okay, so the floor is open, discussion is yours. The microphones are over there. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Yes, Michelle, you, you touched on a subject that's very close to me. So many of my comments friends... I, sorry, sorry, yeah, that's right. Please just tell us shortly your name and where you come from. I'm Kevin Hansen from the U.S. I'm a filmmaker and an environmental activist. Um, I'm also a great fan of Drupal, the open source system. How do we keep the commoners from starving to death between now and when we have these new systems operating? <laughs> Next, no, just, yeah, yeah, we just can collect some, some of them. Sh sh please, yeah, show to them if you want to speech. Hi, I'm Neil Gornflow uh, with um, Shareable Magazine, um, United States, and I, I Michelle, I, um, I, w I wonder if you could just state again the, the, that three-step strategy for the transformation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I am Maya Fuster. No, because uh, confronting the two uh, presentations, uh, your, your core uh, approach is that the traditional comments are sustainable, and uh, uh, Michael say, digital commons are, are there, but uh, we have not solved the issue of sustainability. So are there lessons that can be learned from the traditional common sustainability in order to be applied to the mm -hmm. sustainability of digital commons? Uh, and this is a question for both, I guess, right? Well, for both, yeah. for both, yeah. Okay. I'm uh, Andreas Weber, um, uh, I'm a r book and magazine writer, and I'm, I think um, we're running out of time. Um, so I would uh, like to, to put a, th a fourth question into it. Um, how can we speed it, speed it up? And I'm, I'm um, basically um, looking at uh, what is going on with nature and um, how many, um, well, um, corporations and states are just buying it up, so, so doing a, a new um, enclosure, and we, we, we don't have time, so we, we should keep that in, in mind so mm -hmm. as an inspiration for discussion. And, and please keep in mind as well that uh, at least I consider that all of you are, are commoners, are experts, are, uh, can contribute your own ideas to answer the question just raised. It's not, those are not or at least I say in questions for two panelists, but if one of you want to engage to answer them, the floor is open as well. So we take two more. My okay. name is George yeah. Paul. And the oh. First, of, uh, okay, first you and then George, okay? Hi, I'm Beatriz from Madrid, from Traficantes de Sueños, a publishing house, and I would like to ask for both if they have worked or studied about also social commons as health system, educational system, because you have talked about traditional ones, like natural ones or um, digital commons, but perhaps it's interesting also talking about the social commons and urban commons. And George, yeah. 
George Paul from Community Intelligence United Kingdom. It's a question to Michelle. Uh, how can you share your Prezi presentation in a way that it would um, trigger a shared reflection by all of us, including all of us who are not here in this room, in a way that would uh, strengthen the collective intelligence and the collective sensing of the community about open architecture, open movement. You have such a wonderful overview, and I think that it, uh, it could feed us, and in turn, the intelligence of the collective could make those maps even more precise. Uh, it's a very good question from Kevin, and um, if I know the answer, I'd be rich already. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I know what you talk about, and I've experienced this myself. You know, as I devoted my own life to creating the Knowledge Commons, the P2P Foundation, I lost about 90% of my uh, wealth. So I'm very aware of uh, scarcity issues and, and uh, self-sustainability issues. But I also know that I cannot go on like that, right? So my own idea from my own solution is to create a sustainable business around the P2P Foundation, around the idea of, okay, we, all, we know a transition is taking place, we all need help, and here is an entity that provides you with seminars, webinars, books, CDs, of what the collectivity has produced answering those questions. Uh, I hope that will work. Um, I, I'm very enthused because um, uh, I, I met people uh, in Madrid uh, last week called lasindias.net who have created a very successful uh, entity around the globalizing small business presence in the world and they're organized as a medieval guild. I loved it, uh, it was a really interesting outfit. Um, but in other words, they had these egalitarian communities within the cooperative, um, and they are, you know, providing a real service um, to small businesses globally, uh, like fair trade organizations which need a presence in the West and, and things like that. Uh, and they're building a sustainable, uh, you know, solidarity-based entity. They also give away one third of their income, which is great, uh, you know. To, to change the world. So it's a little bit like the Focolare uh, movement uh, in South America, kind of similar structure. So I think, you know, it's not, maybe not sound romantic, but this is something we need to do. We, uh, you know, you have somehow, if you want to survive in the world, you have, you need to respond to some social need that people are willing to support you with. And that can come to subsidies from the state, fundraising from civil society itself, or through market mechanism. There's no, miracle out there that can change it for us. Um, uh, but I think there is enough maturation now in the movement so that this becomes the key issue today. This is why the Free Culture uh, Forum, which I was last week, um, no, not yesterday, uh, with Mayo, the theme was sustainability of free culture. And I think around the same time, just before, there was a, a conference in, in Holland called the Economy of the Commons, or two weeks before, okay. Oh, it's from now, it's not happened yet, okay. Okay, so so this is the hot issue right now, right? So we're no longer playing around. We, the people in the free software, free culture movement know that this is a key issue. Now I think in free software, they have largely, maybe not in Drupal, but they've you know largely found solutions to become sustainable. That's certainly not the case yet in free culture, and it's only starting to be the case in, in, in free design. Uh, but. Uh, to answer Mayo's suggestion, I think that's a great idea. I think that, you know, if local commons uh, who have sustained, who are sustainable but difficultly uh, can connect with digital commons and create global networks that will offer both sustainability issue locally but also for the people here. Uh, and this is the answer, you know, transnational uh, organization. You know, I'm not against the state, I'm not against the market per se, and we, we, they will still exist, but we need something new. You know, we cannot just stay, protect the welfare state, uh, and, you know, we need something new. We need new answers to our problems, which are not the same as the problems of industrial workers in the 19th century, right? We need new mechanisms. Could you perhaps, could you perhaps 
as Neil asked you to do a uh, repeat the three steps. Oh, yes. That so may be useful for all sorry. of us. So, so the, the first question was, uh, how can we survive uh, by responding to social needs in the current system? In other words, in a system we have not chosen but is there, has a certain logic, interest-based money, et cetera, et cetera. Second, how can we create activities that strengthen our own ecology and our own networks using a different logic, for example, using the credit commons that Thomas Greco will call, uh, talk about, or, or currencies which has different characteristics, uh, or mutual coordination systems, or whatever, right? But based on this new value system, which incorporates that new value system. And third, uh, what kind of activities can we develop for which we don't need monetization? You know, like young people today are doing with card surfing, they can travel and lodge without spending money. Uh, okay, this, and Neil, Neil Gornflow, I think you, s I hope you speak uh, during these days, he's um, uh, from Shareville magazine, and you know, he is examining on a continuing basis the, all these new product service systems that are coming out, like zip cars and peer-to-peer -peer car sharing system, bike sharing systems. There's a lot we can do to demonetize a large swath of our activities and which can make us sustainable by exchanging services and goodwill and cooperation uh, that doesn't take place through the classic market system. So a kind of combination of these three questions, and need, the answers need to be concrete. You know, there's no abstract answer that is valid for everybody. And then, of course, institutional. What, what, what kind of institutional legal support do we, do we need to do that? Because a lot of things that we'd like to do, we cannot do because it's illegal. Right, so, well, if you like to share music, well, it's illegal. Uh, if you want to put your baby dancing on the internet and sing a happy birthday, it's illegal, because happy birthday is copyrighted. Um, you know, this is a real case. Um, so we need to change the laws. We need political voices, like the Green Party, the Pirate Party, and any, any sympathetic, as far as I'm concerned, any sympathetic politician and policymaker. I think this is one of the key issues of this meeting. How can we create global networks of policymakers that can rapidly respond to these issues uh, that is not necessarily you know, based on one particular party, uh, but is in agreement with the, those new values, and that we can quickly mobilize as the Open Net Coalition has done uh, in Europe, to very quickly have a, a major impact. Right, Philip, where are you? Five guys in the garage, uh, Philip, there, right? Who, who were successfully mobilizing a global European network that did not win, but did, uh, did have a real effect on, on the law that came out. So this is the kind of things we need to do. And, and Ruth, I would like to add, um, is this something those modern commons, more tech-oriented commons, um, could learn from the traditional ones, as Michelle said, and and vice versa? What would you expect in terms of support um, offered by those new infrastructures and this, those new ways of commoning? Thanks. Um, uh, Charlotte Hess and Eleanor Ostrom have a really good book about the knowledge commons, which does some of this interface. Uh, so I'll just point you to that. But I think there are some really important lessons from the traditional commons. First is the issue uh, for this issue of sustainability. One is that there is an evolution of norms which is facilitated by communication and repeated interaction. So there's a lot of work actually being done in um, experimental games, actually, which looks at what's the effect of if you allow people to communicate. Because a lot of this breakdown is based on a prisoner's dilemma kind of game, where people can't communicate and it's a one-shot interaction. And so if you have, the, the real critical thing is building trust, which depends on communication and knowing that it's not a one-shot game, that there will be repeated interaction. That if I make something available to you, 
you or somebody else will make things available to me. So that's, that's a, um, and building up reputation is another aspect. Um, and also tapping into these other values that I mentioned. So one thing is that the, the new information, the digital or the knowledge commons, there's new technologies that allow that communication among people who can't meet face to face like we are now. Um, there are ways that people develop reputations on the web or, or um, in fact, you know, like even um, uh, eBay or something, you know, there's, there's reputational aspects that are being built up. And also there's socialization that you are just told don't do that because um, you know, you, you tell your, your child don't litter because if, if you drop that paper then other people will too. Well there's, there's these other kinds of socialization that we have to be doing which is and, and realizing that there's more at stake than just just your narrow economic self-interest and how do we tap into those values. So those are some pointers, but I think there's, there, there is a growing literature on this interface of what are the lessons. And vice versa, the lessons? Um, well, I, I, you know, I must say I, I actually came to the traditional commons through the digital commons. So I, I represent, I think, a generation that even didn't know what the commons was. And even the first time I saw IASC, I thought, you know, okay, this is an academic uh, thing, right? So it took it took quite a while, I think, uh, for people like me and other people in, in my generation, knowledge, you know, Western knowledge workers, to realize that, hey, you know, these things existed before us. And the commoning, you know, we didn't invent it. I, th I think we originally thought we invented it. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, anyway, so I think... Uh, Okay, I'd like to make a formulation because a lot of people think you know it's very complex to change the world, and I like to make a little case. It's very easy to do uh, because we know what's wrong, right? We know that we have a system that's based on pseudo abundance, which does not recognize the limits of the natural world. We know we have a, a system that doesn't want to recognize the natural abundance of sharing immaterial knowledge and culture and science and innovation and so imposes artificial scarcity. And we know we have a system that is not socially just. So, if we can combine all the forces in the world, and there are many who want to save our planet and their local environments against depredation, if we can combine that with all the forces in the world, and this is more people like us, who are increasingly mobilized around digital commons, for the same reason as you, you know, we love what we've made. You know, it's, it starts from love. It's because we're making these things together that we learn to appreciate contributors and the stuff that we have made together, you know, that commons, that software, that, that design. Uh, so as we defend our free culture, right? And then if we combine it with all the forces concerned with social justice, in other words, I would say the new commons, the traditional commons, and the labor and workers' movements, Right? Then we have the basis for a very powerful 21st century social movement. And I would suggest that this is what we're here to do. Wow. Just to remember, this just our first plenary discussion. We have 25 more minutes and a lot of hands up there. Pat. Uh, 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 Johannes, I will do it this way. Pat, Johannes, Ooh. you, you, you. Go, go on. Okay, so maybe you can see behind the camera. We'll take five, six, seven, and we'll take five, six, seven, and you're invited to engage into a discussion among us. Pat, the microphone. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Pat Mooney from the Etc. Group in Canada. Um, I, I really like the concept of the commons and, and support it strongly. I am always 
confused or uncertain of whether we should be calling it the solution or simply the conclusion. Um, the, the, the commons in the traditional commons that we've described works extremely well and still does in many parts of the world. It doesn't have to answer the question that Michelle was asking, his first question about how do we make it work now. It is working now, it's under attack certainly, he's absolutely right about that, but it works. The reason why it stops working or doesn't work so well is because it is under attack from monopolistic powers, from under attack of capitalism. If it weren't for capitalism, then the commons would be just fine. And it's equally true uh, if we talk about the digital commons, I think, or, or, or other uh, aspects of the commons that are less traditional, they would be fine and they would work and they would be viable if it weren't for capitalism. And so to me, again, we would have the commons if we didn't have the other problem. So should we be spending our time challenging the powers that be directly or do we, or we should be spending our time creating the commons. To me, the, the battleground is still fighting the powers that be, fighting the capitalism that's there, the globalization that is there, to get so they can leave us alone to have the commons. So I just, just for me, it's, it's a question to the panel of, of, is it the chicken or the egg, which comes first? Uh, is it, the, again, is the commons the conclusion or is it seen as a solution? Johannes Heimrath, OEA Magazine and Club of Budapest. Um, I would put your first question a little bit further. Uh, thinking of the people Ruth was showing us, uh, these uh, are people who have an ecological footprint less than one. We have an ecological footprint more than three, up to five here in Middle Europe. I'm living in a community since more than 30 years and we are always trying to lower our footprint. But as long as I am here with car and I use this computer and this microphone and this magnificent technology in this house, concrete and steel and glass and look around. What are we doing? Is this kind of a contract with the devil using technology which we are not happy about? You said we don't compete, we do simply something different. What do we different is my question. You, it was you, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Alex Rollin, and I've been editing on the P2P Foundation Wiki with Michelle for the last six months. And I was recently banned from the social email list, which is part of the consensus democracy hypothetical way that the knowledge commons is administered. And my hope is just that we'll all find a place where we can write and collaborate, and that we'll take actions and steps to make people feel welcome and write some rules and develop some norms together that we'll feel free to publish what we found and that we'll feel free to invite each other. And I'd just like to ask what remedial steps you're taking, Michelle, to correct that situation for the foundation. And I ask, also said that, Ruth, you said you had infrastructure that you were offering folks. And I understand that the Bull Foundation is not currently offering a wiki where we can collaborate and write together. So I just hope that we can all do that as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to really go into details of this. You know, every community has social norms, and some people have issues with that, and then some things happen. Uh, so this is a discussion that we'll have separately from this uh, place. I, 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 I guess I didn't get a question, but if there was a question to the Bowl Foundation, we could ask the, the people from Bowl Foundation to do that. To restate the question, <clears throat> I asked what steps the, the plenary groups are taking in the transformation paradigm to ensure that we're providing infrastructure for collaboration now and into the future, because they can be very simple steps. And I asked directly, because Ruth said, I ask is providing infrastructure for collaboration, and I wanted to know specifically what she's doing, and specifically what steps Michelle is taking okay. to allow a more democratic procedure for collaboration. We take, we take some more, please, yes. Oh, Joanna, Martina. Silke. Silke. Um, uh, mm, I have this, the question is this, yes, it's coming, it's coming. So <laughs> Michelle told us that the problem now is to give a political power to the commons and the commoners, okay? And he explained to us 
or he gave many suggestions as the steps to be taken in order to make it possible to give political voice to the commons. When Ruth spoke, I understood that she didn't say, ever say to give political voice, but she only said what lessons natural uh, mm, commons can give us. Now, to me, it seems that there is a big difference between give political voice and to learn lessons. Now, the question is, if I understood clearly, and also if you, you feel that the two, sub, two topics, natural uh, commons and digital commons are at the different stage of elaboration, knowledge, or whatever you like, and, and because of course the problem of political power doesn't arise only for digital commons, but it arises even more for subsistence commons, which as the natural commons are. Thank you. Okay. Massimo and Amira. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah. And please introduce, introduce yourself before yes. speaking. Hello, uh, my name is Massimo De Angelis from the Common website and University of East London. Uh, thank you very much for your two great interventions that uh, give us an idea of uh, two um, different uh, commons, but uh, with some obviously f foundational uh, shared, shared foundations. Uh, the question came out, what is the relation between the sustenance commons that Ruth was talking about and the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, digital commons that Michelle was talking about. And I think uh, we can talk about this later on, but I think we should start really uh, the discussion about the relations uh, from the uh, world we live in. And uh, I think the relations is that uh, one of the main foundation of, of the relation is that the digital commons within the current uh, framework of capitalist markets depends heavily on the enclosures or sustenance commons uh, for uh, maintaining themselves. Uh, just to uh, uh, quote uh, recent research, uh, uh, Gartner research in 2007 uh, estimated that uh, of the 200 million of internet users around the world, uh, the entire in information technology just for internet searching and, uh, accounts for approximately 2% of global carbon dioxide, uh, dioxide emissions. That is a figure equivalent to aviation. And the digital commons are actually expanding far more than aviation, which is already an expanding industry. Um, now, uh, two of, of, of typical web searches correspond to about boiling a cattle uh, of, of water. Uh, now, this is, uh, uh, obviously, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't do web searches or we, we, shouldn't, or we should kind of demonize IT. No, I'm not saying this. I'm saying that, uh, that, 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 that the infrastructure of digital commons heavily rely on hardcore, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuel uh, and, and all the usual stuff that contribute to, um, uh, to global warming. And of course, the extraction of a, a huge amount of minerals for the uh, development of the hardware technology. Uh, one microprocessor uh, requires 100 liters of water to be produced. Now, I'm sure we can find new ways, peer-to-peer -peer ways to reduce the uh, impact of this, but in the current situations of, 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 of global capitalism, uh, the, the infrastructure of the digital commons actually is contributing to the enclosures of land, of, of resources, of forests, which, uh, 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 which communities around the world need for their sustenance, but that corporations and mining corporations around the world need for uh, fueling the world uh, economy. So this is an issue that I would like to put at the center of the discussion, not just to be brushed aside, but to problematize, because we cannot talk about digital commons or sustenance commons without thinking, problematizing politically the relations between the two. And I would like to make another point, if I'm allowed. 
very small point. That and point. and and uh, to reiterate something that uh, uh, that has been uh, already <laughs> said as a joke, well, not really a joke, a real issue, which is uh, the question of uh, how do we prevent the commons to starve from now to the moment in which we'll have a different kind of social system. And this is a, a real issue. It's an issue that has not been discussed here, not even mentioned. But again, I don't, I, I cannot conceive. A, a, a discussion about commons without having to problematize the question of power, of what we mean by power, of because because history doesn't go uh, simply. Well, we, we, in retrospect, we can look at history and see tendencies, but in the here and now, the ten tendencies are working themselves out as particular battles, as particular uh, <laughs> bringing together powers uh, of. of of, of different va social groups, social classes, social sectors, and, and fighting their own battles in different ways. And so we should link the question of commons to the question of power. And the first power, really, and that's again where the issue of sustenance commons come in, and what, what we learn from sustenance commons is that sustenance commons give the commoners power. Power to uh, refuse the market to a certain extent to a certain extent, to different degrees. To refuse the, uh, uh, I mean, we know that the enclosures enclose the land and force people to work in factories. I mean, that is a question of power. Take the land away and you have created the modern proletariat. You know? So what I'm just sim simply say here is we, we need to, to, to ground the question of commons and the question of power. We have to problematize that. Otherwise, we will be a mouse movement. We, we, I, w I would suggest we take just two. two ah, yeah. OK, we take three more. That is Franz, that is you, and, and you. And, and then we make a finish, finish here. Uh, Central Center of Sustainable Economics in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Jazzicon, and um, I wanted to speak first of all to the gentleman who was at the back and now disappeared, um, talking about uh, should it be about. Please, 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 please think for translation. Speak oh, I'm sorry. not so fast. Yeah. All of you Americans, British people, and so on, English natives, please be a little patient with us. Thank you. Thank you, you for the reminder. Um, the gentleman at the back spoke to the whether we should be addressing taking uh, down capitalism or building commons-based economic solutions, and uh, it's clear to me it's a false dichotomy. We need to be engaged with both of these, hopefully at the same time, and we're inspired by movements in uh, the Global South, especially, who are doing these things simultaneously, and there's something we're trying to grow more in the Global North. Um, community, it's vital that we have, we're building um, economies rooted in the commons that are developing, because we need visions of a world worth fighting for and we need to be able to sustain communities who are on the front lines of the ecological and economic crisis. Um, but at the same time, we need a resistance struggles to be able to access the resources. We need to build these commons-based alternatives. Land doesn't come out of thin air. It's fought for and won. And the financial resources we need as well uh, can be secured as well through, through organized struggle. So um, I just wanted to respond to that directly. Yeah, I, I would like to, to underline your doubt about what Pat said. I'm not convinced that would be really well off and everything would be just fine if capitalism just disappeared from this world today. Because capitalism has really brought us to an entirely different world and there's heavy problems on our shoulders if we want it or not. And uh, we have to address if we really think that a uh, commons-based economy is a solution, we have to address the full range of problems. Um, but just to, to answer shortly to the question that, that was uh, burning at the beginning, how do we not starve? And it also re relates to, to the other issues. Part of the answer lies in the discovery of the complementary potentials of the commons that we all are representing. 
So uh, I think uh, we should we should stop just seeing those different comments as strains that run parallel, but uh, they have to mingle, they have to interact with each other, and I think uh, we should really put an emphasis on vigorously seek to find ways we can make our work in the commons useful for each other and. Uh, uh, have, for example, the knowledge commons and the physical local commons, as you put it, interact much, much more and uh, target it with each other. Uh, so, like, uh, I want to give you an example. Uh, if there is a problem uh, of running uh, uh, an irrigation system of a rice field in Thailand and there is a lake just 30 feet below, uh, there is ingenuity needed, a solar pump, for example, and that is, that is really a task for a knowledge commons. And we have not yet uh, even, even scratched the surface of this relation. And uh, I think uh, we should understand uh, each other's needs uh, in order to, to really uh, create leverage uh, that was so much requested. And the last one. Good morning. I speak in Spanish. Por lo tanto, a partir de ahora, eh, quienes no entiendan español, fuch. Bien, yo vengo de Uruguay eh, y creo que el desafío de estos dos días es muy importante, eh, no solamente para discutir, eh, bueno, cómo hacemos y cómo gestionamos nuestros bienes comunes, sino cómo impedimos que el sistema se coma los bienes comunes. Eh, en Uruguay, por, por ejemplo, eh, nosotros entendimos como sociedad que el agua era un bien común, eh, una iniciativa popular hizo que en la constitución de la república el agua se transformara en bien común y el desafío hoy es cómo lograr que ese bien común no eh, esté dominado por las grandes corporaciones, a pesar de que está en nuestra constitución Hoy eso, los territorios no están en manos de los bienes comunes, no están en manos de la gente y quienes tienen los territorios son las grandes corporaciones porque están poniendo en riesgo eh, la calidad y la cantidad de agua. Por lo tanto, ese bien común ya no está siendo parte de nosotros, parte de la gestión comunitaria y cuando hemos logrado gestionarlo comunitariamente, nos enfrentamos directamente a las corporaciones y al capital. Por lo tanto, yo creo que claramente el sistema capitalista es muy perverso en este sentido y eh, para nosotros eh, la gestión comunitaria es trascendente, pero está siendo amenazada directamente por el capital. Por lo tanto, casi está en extinción eh, quienes gobiernan comunitariamente esos bienes y creemos que es un punto de discusión cómo enfrentamos, cómo pensamos y cómo defendemos la gestión comunitaria de esos bienes comunes. Gracias, María. There were a lot of questions and we will not be able to answer all of them. That's why there's Commonopolis, another space of and two more days of conference and um, facilities, online facilities for uh, a follow up communication process, of course. But one, one of the questions was, what do we actually do different? Um, or is using this kind of technology in your comments also a path with the devil? You might remember, um, then there was the question about um, what, what is, in a certain way, what is more important to challenge the power relations we currently face from within the system we have to deal with, or to construct new comments and try to gain autonomy uh, and more sustainability within interlinked um, realms of natural and knowledge commons. And um, just one suggestion, I don't want to forget the question uh, from the round we had before on the social commons, the urban commons. There are some people here very knowledgeable on, on the issue of urban commons and it would be certainly great. You use the blind date um, uh, board and commonopolis 
or even organize for a self-organized workshop to tackle with uh, th that, to deal with that issue, because it's uh, at least here in Germany as well, it's very important for us to take some further steps. Who wants, who wants to begin? Uh, Misha. Um, <coughs> so what do we do different? Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, we work together without necessarily being paid for it. And everything we do can be used by everybody. Now, tell me one capitalist firm who does that. I don't know of any. Uh, so we don't use intellectual property. That's already a really big change. And the second thing is we don't produce commodities. We don't sell. We don't make things to sell. Um, we have low threshold participation mechanisms. Um, there's a, we use distribution of tasks instead of division of labor. Um, I mean, I could give you a long list of practices that uh, are different from the way a for-profit firm or a state bureaucracy would organize production. Uh, does that mean we do everything perfectly? No. Does that mean we, we address uh, all the issues in the optimum way? No. But for example, to, you know, to react to Massimo's um, uh, remark, uh, this is one of the big issues in our, in our, in our movement, you know, the digital footprint. We, we think about it, we build software so that we can distribute resources and not have to centralize them like Google. So as many, many people are building knowledge commons around reducing the footprint of digital technology. Uh, so a lot of people are aware of that, are working on it. I would argue that, you know, it's probably um, that digital commons is not just the uh, problem, it's also the solution, that it's by sharing information and knowledge that we're going to tackle all these big global problems and not by, you know, not using them because they're, they use energy and, and remain isolated in our communities. I think we need both. We need to use that infrastructure for good. And even if we have a world with limited resources, you know, I would argue that one of the things we want to keep is this global communication and it will be worth investing in it even as it does use energy because of all the social good it brings on the side. So this is a question of balance. Um, and, uh, you know, books, books have a very heavy footprint. How are we going to stop reading using books? I don't know. We, maybe we can share books, right? We develop a sharing infrastructure for books like libraries and, and all the book commons we now have that exist. Um, you know, I live in Thailand and, uh, you know, when, when the government gave money to the villages um, that they could freely use, you know, what poor people did, they bought two things, a mobile phone and a motorcycle. That's, that's the thing they needed to, to work and to go to the market and to, to function in this world. So, um, you know, these are vital needs for people and, uh, you know, any society needs to answer those needs. Uh, um, so I don't think the digital commons is the enemy of that. On the contrary, I think it's it's a vital part of the solution. Um, thanks for the the question on the IFC collaboration platform. Stefan Dorn had set up a Ning platform, which would have been ready quite some months ago, and then Ning privatized. So we have had to switch to a different platform. It should be ready by January. But I'll mention that ISC as itself is a commons, as an association, and we have been facing many of the same problems that a lot of people are used to. We've made a lot of our resources available open access, and so a lot of people say, why should I contribute at all? Why should I pay anything? And we do have, you know, a couple of people who need to earn an income uh, to actually keep the, you know, to provide certain services. So there is this tension that at some point, people still need to eat and get resources. So um, there is still this tension. But I wanna end with this point about a political voice for the commons. That is absolutely fundamental. And um, I'll point to Jagdish here, uh, who is organizing, he's not only organizing the next, I ask conference in India, but he's with Foundation for Ecological Security in India, and the reason they wanted to host the conference there 
was to create a political voice for the commons in India where, you know, 45 percent poverty rate, people really basically dependent on commons, and these commons are mostly called wastelands, and the government sees giving them to corporations to boot, do biofuels as a way of increasing the value, because they're not counting this. So one of the things that Jagdish has is a commons initiative to try and learn from how did the UK build this coalition? for the commons. How did they do it in South Africa? To tap this different international expertise and really take it to higher levels in the government, as well as to publicize it to the urban people who didn't, don't even know what is a commons in India anymore. And so I think those that issue of how do we build a political voice for the commons for those resources on which those really, really poor people depend is so fundamental. I think it's, it's something we can't neglect in all of this. And if you have suggestions on how to do this, <laughs> for those of you who are engaged in policy making in Germany or elsewhere, please come talk to one of us. Seems like an important issue for the innovation workshop to discuss tomorrow how to build a political coalition on the commons. Very, very small. Very short. Sentence. So I just want to say, uh, you know, we have to learn to chew gum and walk the street at the same time. So in other words, um, it's not a question of or building an alternative or building power in a political organization. You know, the labor movement had unions, had political parties, had co-ops. They did it all together. It's not a question of you, you, you cannot just do politics and not have your own power and your own forms of life. So it's really a question of integrating and balancing those competing uh, demands and, and not of choosing between them. Thank you. Thank you. All of you, Ruth, Michelle.